Luke Messer goes on the attack in the latest debate. Joe Donnelly backs a Trump nominee. That plus Vice President Pence in Indiana and more on Indiana Week in Review for the week ending April 27th, 2018. Ice Miller is proud to support Indiana Week in Review. Ice Miller, with a 100-year tradition of learning what is important to clients and strategizing with them toward a common goal. Today, Ice Miller continues its commitment to help clients build, grow, and protect their interests. More at icemiller.com. This week, Congressman Luke Messer didn't hold back in the latest primary debate between Indiana's three Republican Senate candidates. The debate was sponsored by the Allen County Republican Party, and while again the three candidates didn't have many policy differences, there were plenty of attacks, including jabs from Luke Messer. Todd Rakita was told last week by the Trump administration to take down his advertisements because he's faking, he's faking support from the Trump campaign. He's got the support of a That's couple a lie. Trump campaign volunteers. Fellow candidates Mike Braun and Todd Rakita were on the warpath too, but this was the first time in a debate Messer has so engaged in attacks against both opponents. Is Luke Messer struggling to get back into the race? It's the first question for our Indiana Week in Review panel. Democrat Ann Delaney, Republican Mike O'Brien, John Schwannis, the host of Indiana Lawmakers, and political analyst John Ketzenberger. I'm Indiana Public Broadcasting Statehouse reporter Brandon Smith. Ann Delaney, was this a sign that Luke Messer is trailing? Yes. <laughs> How worried should he be? You got 30, well, you got 30 I, minutes to go. <laughs> <laughs> Spread it out a little bit. I, I think he ought to be Check worried. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that he is worried because, you know, he took the high road initially because he thought he was the leading candidate, and now he's not taking the high road any longer. I mean, like I said once before, I think the, these guys are like the three stooges. I mean, the biggest thing he can talk about is the yard signs, okay? I mean, they're exploding the deficit. They're trying to take health care away. They're ruining the exports for Indiana farmers and on and on and on. And what are we talking about? Whether the yard signs are authorized or not and where Luke Messer sleeps. It's, you know, it's the, it is a race to the bottom and they are all winning. If you're, if you were watching this race, it would be impossible to tell whether Todd Rokita was trailing or leading or anything else because he has been on the attack from day one. But given that Messer was the sort of more positive campaign and has since delved more into the attacks that the other two have been doing, does it now, does that make it look a lot like he's worried about where he is in this race? I, I think the undecideds in this are so high because these three were even on money, even on organization, even on, show, no, I know, but <laughs> I, the, the undecideds are really high. Um, and Luke, it's, it's not a bad strategy for that Luke Messer had to introduce himself to voters first and then contrast himself against the, the other two. That's not, a, that's not a bad strategy. I don't think it means that he's way behind or it's even or I, I think um, it could go, I mean, it could go any way really in, in, in my mind. It's some of these, uh, and there's new dynamics where there's now chatter about Democrats pulling Republican ballots in certain areas where maybe they don't have competitive races, so will that have an impact? Um, which is interesting because one of the attacks in like multiple races around the state now are Republicans who are running today, but 10 years ago pulled a Democrat ballot at the insistence, like uh, at John, the insistence of like the far right. Like Donald you know, Trump, guys. Trump used to do before he became and a Republican. So it's really it's just an inter it's like an interesting it's an interesting finish here. The last debate is next week, and I'm sure we'll talk about that again uh, next week. But I think it it could be wide open. It, you know, we could look back at it and go, well, that's exactly how we thought it would work out. Exactly should, should how we do have, you think it'll work out? I, I'm not going to play think. that little game, Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Should we have, um, would this have been better for Luke Messer to go, I mean, to be on the attack a little sooner? Would it have helped him? I'll let you know on the morning of May 9th. Um, <laughs> go out on a limb, John. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> I'm not privy to, the, to the valid numbers. If yeah, I had, hey, if good. I had all of the, the data, valid data, I could probably speak with a little more authority. What I can only do in this situation is, read into and draw inferences from what we're seeing both in the on-air campaigns and at the performances at the debates. And that would suggest that somebody sees something that says, you know, turn it up a notch. Uh, and I, although I will, uh, maybe it's splitting the baby, but maybe you can You're have- You're good at that though. I know, well, that's, you know, a little bit. I see, I see shades of gray. Everywhere. But, <laughs> Everywhere, even in your no. Oh, uh, oh, oh <laughs> so, my. Sorry. Uh, I wouldn't talk about. I'm going to go to John. All right, Ketson go to John. Yes, yeah, so I'll just, just, just help you. Let me just say you can be negative and and cutting perhaps in a debate setting, 
and still get away by getting the, the placard at the end that says you didn't go negative in your television spots. I mean, oh, well, he people will draw that television distinction. Spots yeah. too, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did the here? Does it look like? Uh, I mean, did Luke Messer almost have to go here because of what he was getting from the other two? Yep. I mean, he had to return fire because he was taking so much fire. Uh, and as Ann likes to describe, sometimes it's a circular firing squad, and if you're not firing back, you're just you're just you're getting. Just dead. You're just dead, that's right. And, you know, we aren't privy to, there aren't any public polls. You know, unfortunately, none of the media uh, outlets or, or anybody else is, is uh, conducting a, a poll, or we haven't seen any anyway. So we really only can speculate what it, we're, we're by the strategy. And I think using that kind of inference, you can say that Mike Braun uh, has definitely um, run a good campaign. I think that he has probably. Um, taking a lead uh, because he's being attacked by both sides pretty strongly, whereas before he was pretty much ignored. And I think that coming on such close proximity of saying he's not going to go negative and then to going negative uh, suggests that um, Luke Messer was looking at the information and said, I better do it or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get yeah, shot now. Yeah, there's only so much time left. Well, Democratic U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly, the man they're hoping to replace, he this week announced he'd support President Trump's nominee for Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Pompeo, the former CIA director and Kansas congressman, was nominated by President Trump to replace former Secretary Rex Tillerson, who Trump fired earlier this year. That's even as progressive groups made a push to submarine Pompeo's ascension. Joe Donnelly, who faces a tough re-election fight in a predominantly Republican state, says he believes Pompeo is capable of advancing American interests and delivering honest assessments to President Trump. Donnelly says he had a productive conversation with the GOP nominee when they met earlier this month. Mike O'Brien, is this purely a political move from Joe Donnelly? Yes, in keeping with one, one word answers. Um, <laughs> okay, the, scratch a little deeper. So there were, <laughs> yeah, um, there were five uh, of the, I think, seven Democrats that voted for this confirmation. Five of them are um, in. Um, uh, Tough they're up for re-election. They're yeah. up for re-election one this year, that, and all of them are in, in states from states that Trump won. So I think once it became clear that the Republicans were going to nominate him at that point, if you're Harry Reid, you look at those, you know, your, your top five targets and go, all right, everybody's voting for, you know, uh, voting for confirmation, just so you can go home and explain it. In, a, in what in a state like Indiana, West Virginia, North Dakota, the others that uh, where Trump maintains his popularity. Given given the position that. Donnelly has sort of staked himself out for where, well, you know, I vote for Hoosiers and sometimes I vote with the left and sometimes I vote with the right. Was this a, was this a no-brainer for him? This was an example of doing that. I mean, finally, uh, President Trump proposed somebody for a cabinet position that at least has credibility, okay? <laughs> I mean, he's not handing out amphetamines and opioids to people going up and down the aisle. He's not a crook as far as anybody knows. And so he finally had somebody, the bar, <laughs> this is the most corrupt administration we've ever had in this country. It's ridiculous. They sell the office of the presidency. They sell everything else. They're using taxpayer money willy-nilly. And when you look at, for example, the EPA's had record from starting when he was in the state Senate. It is appalling that this person is in national office. It's appalling. And when you finally get somebody who, are, at least as far as I know from the media reports, is a credible candidate for Secretary of State, which probably means he'll last about three months under the president administration, uh, uh, it's not surprising that, that Joe Donnelly would vote for him. Is There's this a lot of work to do over at, Sec at the State Department right now, so it's good that we're getting somebody <laughs> in yes. there. Yes, <laughs> there's yeah. a few things happening in the world. Few yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, well, um, and, <laughs> and everybody's been fired or quit because of the administration. Do voters see through this one? Do they, does it seem pure, too purely political? You know, I think for most voters, they are probably gauging their decision on something else. But I think the, the risk Donnelly runs here is alienating some of his base. I think that they look at Pompeo less generously than Ann does. Uh, and uh, that may be true of just about anybody that the administration would put up. And so they see this vote, and they are attuned to those kinds of things. And it may cost him some votes in the base, or certainly among those who are more left than he is. So it, it, the, the idea is that you can pick up some of the centrist vote, uh, but you may also lose some of the, the um, more left vote. Is this an issue that will matter on Election Day? I guess it probably depends on what Pompeo's performance is, but even then, probably not much. If He's even there on election day. <laughs> it, 
if you're Joe Donnelly, not just this move, but I mean, a lot of the things he does seem to tack to, while I wouldn't mind picking up a few centrist or even center right votes, even if it means losing a few on the far left, are you far more comfortable in Indiana doing that? Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, look at look who's turned out. Look at some of the, the trends in uh, statewide office in the past few cycles. That probably is prudent. Now, there is, however, and I'll strike up the, the corny naivete band here because there was a time, and I'm not saying we're there now still, in the U.S. Senate where there was a school of thought that unless the person is Totally Wildly unqualified. unqualified yeah. This is the Dick. This was the Dick Luger issue. belief. You know, when there were people. I remember uh, Joycelyn Elders was nominated uh, right. Bill Clinton for, and I forget what her misdeed was, handing out condoms in schools or something that really got stuck in the craw of, of part of the Republican hierarchy. And and Dick Luger said, no, this as long as this person's qualified, I'm. Gonna, and there may be some vestiges of that. Uh, probably, probably not fewer many. And fewer. Uh, but I don't. I mean it. Uh, I've heard him voice that that opinion in the past, well before when well, Obama it was, it, again, was Again, that's a throwback, present. I guess, to they put that in the museum. But uh, it, well, I'm it's not saying right it's devoid position, of political though. calculation. Well, it has the good fortune of perhaps being the right political calculation and maybe the, the right, right kind thing. of statesmanship as well. All right, well, time now for viewer feedback. Each week we pose an unscientific online poll question in conjunction with our Ice Miller email and text alerts. This week's question, will Joe Donnelly's support for Trump nominee Mike Pompeo help the Indiana senator politically? A, yes, or B, no. Last week's question, has Mike Braun become the front runner in the Republican U.S. Senate primary? 42% say yes, 35% say no, and 23%, like Mike O'Brien, say it's too close to call. If you would like to take part in the poll, go to wfyi.org slash iwir and look for the poll. Well, Vice President Mike Pence elevated an Indiana congressional race this week before stopping by the Hoosier State for a local economic development announcement. Pence was originally scheduled to attend a central Indiana political event on tax reform. After it was postponed until after the May primary, Pence instead joined a jobs commitment event for the global tech firm Infosys. Earlier in the week, Pence tweeted out support for 8th District Republican Representative Larry Bouchon. Bouchon faces a right-wing primary challenge from fellow physician Richard Moss, who ran against Bouchon in 2016. Their primary has been a tense one, including an alleged physical confrontation back in February. Pence's tweet says he's throwing his, quote, full support behind the incumbent congressman. John Katzenberger, is Larry Bouchon happy that Mike Pence put a spotlight on his race? You know, I guess you are if you think, well, the vice president wouldn't show up if he thought I was going to lose. <laughs> So from that perspective, I'm sure he is. Um, you know, the vice president's not going to go to bat for somebody who may end up dragging him down later on. Um, mm, as a kind of like president. the president uh, in uh, Alabama. You know, or elsewhere. Well, that's or the elsewhere. president. That's, that's right, what, Pennsylvania. That's, that, that is, of course, the risk <laughs> that's involved here. But I think from the perspective of your question, you can infer that they feel pretty confident that Bouchon's going to win. And uh, if that's the case, then he probably feels the same way. But it's been a very low-profile race. And um, in those kinds of races, especially in something that's as geographically large as that district, um, you know, funny things can happen. And funny things have been happening in the last mm -hmm. few election cycles around the country. Um, does this run the risk of making it seem like Larry Bouchon needs help? Mm. Well, we're playing how many <laughs> layers of <laughs> chess here? It's getting, it's getting... I'm uh, asking a lot of you. Well, I know. This is tough. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing. I mean, uh, you're saying, the, well, again, I'll go back to a, a rosier time. Incumbency was a powerful thing, and, and people in office tended to support, with some exceptions, those individuals who had toiled on behalf of the party out in, the, uh, in their re respective districts. Now, of course, we're in the era of drain the swamp, so I guess in a certain way it runs counter to at least the message that's espoused by the person in the White House, uh, the other person in the White House. But um, I guess all things being equal, I don't think we're to a point where you'd necessarily, you know, keep the don't vice president. That, yeah. yeah, don't put the Heisman Trophy move on him and straight arm him. <laughs> is, this, this is, is this, you know, Larry Bouchon or Mike Pence is just, oh, well, that's a guy from Indiana, my state. Well, first of all, the vice president was here because Governor Eric Holcomb has 
been able to secure this investment from Infosys. This is a national economic development announcement. That it's, was the backup. Okay, hold on. Was 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 two, Mike Pence was here for a local pol or for a political event that got postponed, and, and then into into decided to right. go to and the. So it all worked out, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So <laughs> two hundred fifty million dollars in investment, ten thousand jobs, three thousand in Indiana. We're developing the uh, the old site at the airport. Um, look, one, I don't I don't think Mike Pence is is just looking at this as looking at this is just that, that transactional, right? I mean, they were close when they were in Congress. Uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence won every county in the in the eighth district um, in the general election in 2016. So this makes all the sense in the world, and, and I think it's going to be an easy win for uh, Congressman Bouchon. An easy win for Bouchon. You know, you said this was a low-profile race. He's been a low-profile congressman. What has he done since he's been in there? When you think we had Frank McCluskey in there, who single-handedly stopped the war in Bosnia by pressuring President Clinton to get involved in it, and you have we had Lee Hamilton next door, and now you've got. Mice in as congressman. I mean, you got Bouchon and you got Tennessee Trey, and what have either one of them done? And the answer is not a thing. So he'll probably get reelected. Well, the problem here, and it is squirrely because, and you talked about the polls, uh, which we haven't seen. Maybe Mike has uh, being uh, the party operative, but uh, in the, in the other district, we or I mean in the Senate race, but you don't know which voters. Polling in yeah. this day and age is tough because are these the Trump voters who, to a large extent, hadn't. Uh, very often voted before. in the past and we're coming off the bench to vote just for Donald I Trump? I think that's something every Or is it the more establishment? And so even bit. if we had numbers, and, and that's probably why this district, to the extent that there is some lack of predictability here for an incumbent, uh, that may, be, hurt, the, yeah, that may be the concern. Well, Todd Rokita was called out by a group of Northeast Indiana church leaders for what they say was a racist campaign ad. The Fort Wayne pastors take issue with Rokita's first TV campaign ad, which went on the air a couple months ago. The liberal elites disrespect our flag and the sacrifices of our soldiers. They riot in our streets and attack our police. The African-American church leaders say the ad goes too far, that its images cross a line into racism. The Rokita campaign says the charge is absurd, calling it, quote, political correctness run amok. John Schwanis, if black church leaders call something racist, is calling that absurd a winning response? The, uh, the line of people probably who potentially could be offended by some of the spots in this campaign is long. Um, and so uh, whether that's because of ethnicity or religious belief, uh, you could read a lot into some of these ads. Uh, it's, it's, I found it interesting that the timing. I mean, this spot was one of the it's, uh, the it's earlier literally the first uh, ones, spot and that it's Roe been on. Up. And typically, if you're going to see this kind of uh, episode where you call someone it's out, it's going to happen immediately. To that uh, end, does the timing make this seem more about? Does it make it seem more political from these church leaders? Well, it does make you wonder where they were when it came out and why they didn't react at that time because the ad hasn't changed. And I presume that their attitude about the content of the ad hasn't really changed. So, yeah, it probably has some effect there. But, um, you know, we're at a time when all of these things are, are you know, brushed with a fine comb. And um, the candidates... You know they run these out. Yeah. They we run these. You run these outrageous ads, and uh, you need to be able to to answer it. So the answer to answer your question to John, is calling it absurd a good response? No, that's not a good response. Um, but it's in line with what you would anticipate, I suppose. Does a criticism like this carry more weight, quite frankly, in the general election than it does in the primary? No, I think it can carry some weight in the primary too. I think a lot of people have been offended by the campaign that Rokit has run, and this isn't a dog whistle ad. This is a bullhorn. You know exactly what he's saying. He's saying of blacks that are uh, com uh, complaining about uh, uh, about too much police brutality are what on American uh, and, and they don't respect the flag. Who who are the liberal elites that are in the street demonstrating and not demonstrating by the way rioting, rioting? I mean it's completely offensive. It was designed to be. It was designed to, to appeal to the worst the worst in any people who vote for him. And that's what he's trying to do because he can't get low enough. Is this really gonna make a blip in the primary at this point? I don't think so, like he said, it's been running for months. I'm not even sure it's still running um, because they've switched these ads out so much down the, uh, down the stretch into the last phase. So um, I'm not sure the, just this kind of local press conference is gonna get, get much play, but it's, it was pretty aggressive, pretty aggressive ad. And it, was, and it picked a couple issues that, that are well outside, I think, of what Republican primary voters really care about. Well, Planned Parenthood, <laughs> Planned Parenthood and the ACLU filed a new lawsuit against the state this week asking a federal judge to strike down parts of Indiana's new anti-abortion law.
The lawsuit challenges the 2018 law's new abortion complication reporting requirements and mandated yearly inspections of abortion clinics. Under previous laws, such inspections were optional. Proponents of the law argue both provisions are meant to ensure patient safety and help the state learn more about potential abortion issues. And as Governor Eric Holcomb noted when he signed the bill, 27 states require complication reports. But Planned Parenthood and the ACLU argue the complication reports are unconstitutionally vague, and the lawsuit says some of the complications listed in the law aren't associated with abortions. And the suit challenges the yearly inspection mandate because it says no other health care facilities in the state face such a requirement. Andalini, is there something comforting about the yearly consistency of these lawsuits? Well, if you're the comptroller oh, yeah. for the the comptroller <laughs> for the ACLU, you'd be you know you'd be very comforted by these lawsuits because what we're doing, what Holcomb and the Republican majority and our Attorney General are doing, are, are funding the ACLU with taxpayer money because they're pa passing outrageous laws after session after session after session. And then they go into court, and the attorney's fees are awarded to the prevailing party, and Planned Parenthood and the ACLU have prevailed on every single one. So taxpayer money is going into the ACLU year after year after year, thanks to the Republicans. So if you were the comptroller, you'd be happy. Well, it's just vouchers for ACLU. Um, do you think Republican voters are a little tired of the lawsuit every year? I'm not sure they're aware of it, I, one, but... I think that I think just an under, think about what's happened in the last six months. We've had uh, kind of the far right go after other people in the far right, guys like Representative Tim Wesco and Senator uh, Travis Holmes. I wouldn't consider him far right, or, or Representative Ben Smalls. But the, the, the fringe pro life movement has gone after their kind of own people that have been their champions, and those people have come back on the issue of they just want to ban abortion. Period in yep. Indiana, right? That's the attack, um, and I think legislators. You know, including those guys, have said, "Look, we can't, we can't go that far. We've got to try to mine the line of what's what's appropriate, what's in twenty, what, what are requirements in twenty-seven states. I don't know if those are different here than they are there elsewhere in the in the new law that's passed. Um, but we got to mine that line and do things that we think are more practical than are just begging for a lawsuit and just begging for uh, more taxpayer dollars to be be spent. And I think that's that's been the, the pushback on." Kind of the, the, those folks in the far right that have gone over, have gone after their best yeah. advocates so, in the pro-life. So pro the goal community. is not to gather the information. The goal is to try to restrict the right to abortion as much as you can get legally get away with, right? I, I would think that. I think if, yeah, if you're pro-life, if you're pro I, if you are pro-life, I hope, concerned, I hope exactly the judge, right. I hope the judge hears that. <laughs> is that is that really what the? I mean, it's is it is that what voters are okay with because they are just testing the boundaries of what they can do on this issue? Well, I, I suppose that they're... Uh, are they okay with the costs of that, I suppose? Well, the I'm sure some are. They see this as a, an issue broad, you know, larger than, than dollar signs. This is some, an existential uh, debate. And, and those, there are some who would say, you know, this once again underscores the lack of legitimacy of, of the federal judiciary. Again, I'm, I'm not subscribing to this myself, but there are those, you know, how often do we hear the phrase, there's another unelected activist, activist judge, judge going mm -hmm. against the will of the people. Paying no attention. Oh, I'm not agreeing. Kind of like the Supreme Court did in the decision. I'm that merely put pointing George out Bush that we, we have a constitutional democracy here where certain protections are guaranteed. But there's a lack of, of appreciation of that of that nuance. Uh, so for some folks, they see this as a as a crusade and 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 so cost be damned. Cost be damned. Mike O'Brien mentions this sort of, it's been labeled by some, a civil war going on in the pro-life community in this state or in the anti-abortion uh, community in this state. So do those folks on the fringe who are pushing fairly conservative lawmakers over this issue, does that sort of, even though they may know that there's a lawsuit coming and they may know that they're probably going to lose money to the ACLU, they kind of have to do these bills anyway. Uh, I think that... Um that's the idea here, is to try to appease the far right element here um, by doing as much as they can that they think they can get away with from a judicial check perspective. Um, it's cynical, uh, and it's also hypocritical because many of those people who are on the far right who don't mind spending the money to um, defend this lawsuit are probably the same people who are saying government's too big and doesn't mind the Cut purse. Health care right. for children. So well, finally, yeah. Todd Rakita's campaign released a children's book this week, Oh, the Places You'll Forget. 
It's a jab at Luke Messer over the fact he lives much of the time in Virginia with his family while he serves in Congress. It include lines like, we searched Columbus, Muncie, and a local Richmond pub. I heard someone saw him at a Virginia country club. Mike O'Brien, will this soon replace Dr. Seuss on bookshelves? I'm like the only Republican in the state who's not writing a children's book right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's Everybody doing it. Well, yeah. you gotta, you gotta hop on the bandwagon, man. I know. Um, I just you know, transcribed this week's on the show. Issue, on the, on the issue in general, just irritates, the residency thing irritates me. Everybody makes this decision based on their own family needs and their own financial means and, and for all those reasons. And by the way, we elect them to go to Washington, D.C. The whole job is leaving. <laughs> you know, and then they leave and we, you know, we hammer them for it like we did with uh, uh, Luger in, in well, 2012. Well, because they've forgotten their Hoosier critical Hoosier thing. Roots. And it's all important right. to stay connected and all those things. But these guys, all of them, Republican and Democrats, make their own decision about what's right, whether to move or stay, and how much time to split. All right, well, it sounds like the children's book got under your it did get, skin. The whole thing's getting under That's my skin. That's Indiana Week in Review for this week. Our panel is Democrat Ann Delaney, Republican Mike O'Brien, John Schwannis of Indiana Lawmakers, and political analyst John Ketzenberger. If you'd like a podcast of this program, you can find it at wfyi.org slash iwir, or starting Monday, you can stream it or get it on demand from Xfinity and on the new WFYI app. I'm Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Join us next time because a lot can happen in an Indiana week. Ice Miller is proud to support Indiana Week in Review. Ice Miller, with a 100-year tradition of learning what is important to clients and strategizing with them toward a common goal. Today, Ice Miller continues its commitment to help clients build, grow, and protect their interests. More at icemiller.com.